Hello, Auggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here welcoming all Auggies around the world. If you want to become an Augie, simply subscribe. That's the name for subscribers. I really appreciate it when people subscribe because that tells YouTube this is a great channel. I hope you think so too. This question comes today from M. Durham, NM0D. That's Nancy Mike Zero. Delta. Now, this is one of the emails I found in a huge pile of emails that had come in through a different address, and this is four years old, and I apologize for that. But the thing is, what I did was I went through them. I figured the person who asked the question has probably long answered it, but it remains an interesting question for other people. So let's take a look. He says, we are mounting a Slim Jim antenna for VHF UHF on an outside tower. Let me show you one of those. Okay, this is a Slim Jim antenna. They're normally made for portable use. It's made of some sort of twin lead or ladder line or something like that. And it hangs up and it's got all kinds of good things in here so it'll work. This particular one will work on UHF also. And there's this big, huge piece of shrink wrap tubing that's on it. And then it goes down to here. Note there are cutouts and all kinds of things like that to allow this thing to work properly. Now, this antenna is not meant to be atop a tower. It's meant to hang from a tree. Now, the reason for that is because it's made out of a piece of transmission line. Okay, and then here's the real transmission line down here. Now, the interesting thing about J-pole type antennas, and this is a type of J-pole, is that the antenna itself is balanced. The feed point on this is balanced. So you should put some like ferrite beads right here or wrap a bunch of coax together. The ferrite beads are probably cheaper because if you put like uh, 10 turns of 9 inch around here, you're looking at 25 bucks for the cable, uh, probably more than the Slim Jim cost. Anyway, what he wants to do is put this Slim Jim on his tower. Now, you can. Now, you're going to want to put it on an extension that pushes it out away from the tower, okay? So that it doesn't directly interact. And you'd like to get six or eight feet away from the tower. Now, you can hang it from something that's aluminum or put a bamboo pole up there, whatever, whatever works for you. But it should not be right up against the tower. Now this obviously, if you put this up like this and let it go, falls right down. Okay, so it won't work just right next to the tower and it won't hold itself up. I would recommend if you're gonna put something up there like that, put a regular J-pole and mount it on top of the tower so it's just the J-pole from there on up, okay? And again, you've got that balance to unbalance, but most people feed J-poles just with coax. Now you're gonna run that coax down to the bottom of your tower where it should have a connection between the coax shield and the tower at the base. Now the tower at the base is grounded, of course, some ground rods there, but you just wanna connect the shield on there uh, to the tower, okay? As far as putting in lightning rods, that is entirely up to you. I have suffered a direct lightning strike a number of years ago when I lived in Louisville, Colorado. Boy, that woke me up. I was uh, taking a nap on the couch, and next thing I knew, it was about eight feet in the air. That's how loud it was. And it destroyed my transmission line, vaporized my 40 meter or 20 meter dipole, blew out the modem. I had a Hayes Smart modem, and it uh, destroyed the chip in the power supply. Fortunately, a replacement chip was only a dollar and ruined our garage door opener. So go figure. The point is that when you get a direct strike, all bets are off. Is it possible to put up a tower that can withstand lightning that doesn't destroy your station at the same time? Yes, but you've got to get out the National Electric Code and the Motorola book on that and the ARRL book is the compendium of best practices for ham radio operators. And it's got a lot of stuff in it. Also, they want you to have listed equipment. If your insurance company wants to know why lightning started a fire in your house, they're gonna to wanna to make sure that all the pieces that go down in there are listed. And that's really hard for ham radio. 
So best to ground everything, my switches are Alpha Delta switches. You can see one right through here. This is an Alpha Delta switch. It goes between four inputs. And if you put it in the middle, not only is it grounded, there's a lightning arrestor right there. And then this whole thing is grounded by this ground strap. Okay, so that helps. You've got your lightning arresters. The lightning arrestor should be right where the cable enters the house. And it should stay in the house at that point. Now, if you're on a second floor, it gets a little weird, but can be made to work. I've got other videos on that. So if you want to put up those tower things, if you put them up higher than the J-pole, then you got the problem with the cable right next to the J-pole. So again, you're back to putting the J-pole out on something away from the tower. Don't forget, you can put the Slim Jim out there or the J-pole, the tower itself will act as a reflector. Okay? You've got a two-element Yagi right there. The J-pole and the reflector behind it. So you're going to get most of your signal, most, a lot of your signal is going to be going away from the tower in the direction of the J-pole. So you can put it in several places. By the way, you need to do a trade-off. If you're going to put a J-pole way up on the tower, you're going to have to run a fairly long piece of coax. Well, no matter what you run, even LMR 400, there's going to be losses in the cable at that frequency. So is it better to have the antenna high and a long cable or the antenna just mounted right on your roof or a corner of the house and a much shorter cable, which is going to give you better performance? The antenna performs a little bit more poorly as you get close to ground, but you lose a lot less of the signal. So talk around other people and see what they have to say. Should we bond the coax to the downcomers? The downcomers are going to be bonded to the tower anyway. Should we put ferrite beads on the coax at the feed point? You certainly can. That will help with the balanced to unbalanced type of thing. It's called a choke ballon when you do that. But the thing is that any lightning is going to just pop those things off of there faster than you can say boo. The coax is entering the building about 19 feet above earth. Where should the polyphaser be located? On the ground. You put in a ground rod where your cables come into the house. Bring the cable down to it so your polyphaser or Morgan or Alpha Delta is going to be right there on the ground rod and then you go immediately into the house. Coming into the house at 19 feet above ground provides lightning a great way to get into your house. That's why I recommend you put them down on the ground. That polyphaser should not be up at the air, nor does it go at the base of the tower. It goes right where the coax enters the house, which should be at ground level or close to it. I use a entry panel from KF7P that is located just right outside my shack. In fact, the protected side of it, the cables come directly into the house through a conduit that uh, I put in there, okay? And then that is grounded to my station ground rod, which is then bonded to other ground rods. I've got a ground rod on my step IR, big IR, and I need to run a bond on that. I haven't done that yet, okay? Should we coil the coax where it enters the building? You can, it won't make any difference. It adds inductance to the wire. And in the case of lightning protection, you want to avoid inductance. So you lay out the cable kind of on the ground. Now for normal types of things, such as balanced to unbalanced, winding the coax is fine. Now note that the way coax works, and I'm not talking about with lightning here, the way coax works, what's inside the coax stays inside the coax, and you can coil that up, and the only thing that's affected is the current that's flowing on the outside of the coax, so-called common mode current, okay? So I would recommend that you get that coax, you're going to have to add extra coax to it, but get that coax down on the ground, bury it, you get direct burial coax. You're going to have uh, control cables for the rotor, and those need to find a lightning surge protector when they come into the house. This is an example of one of those. These are eight wires, not four. 
you just bring it in here and there's the baristers and all of the other kinds of thing that you need in here. And then this goes someplace that is very thoroughly grounded, okay? And this is going to get installed, minus this, I'll take that off, uh, into my little entry panel so that I can provide protection for the wires that control my step IR, big IR. So I hope that can help. The absolute best amateur lightning protection system is a same as an absolute best commercial lightning protecting system if you want to follow the National Electric Code. Most amateurs don't have the capability or knowledge to do that, but if you do what I kind of outlined for you, put that ground rod right where the cables are going to enter the building and put your protection in there. Don't ever lay a protected cable near an unprotected cable. They should come in like this to that lightning arrester. And then that goes down on the ground and then you go into the house, okay? Now, if you've got a basement wall that's this high and you don't have the capability of punching a hole in it, you're going to have to either put some metal conduit around it and ground it or something like that to keep the lightning, which is on the unprotected side, from getting to the protected side. Now, there are some ideas in here for providing lightning protection for balanced lines, like ladder line or window line, okay? Basically spark plugs and stuff, so that there's a place for that current to arc over that goes right into the ground rod. That ground rod needs to be bonded, meaning connected, to your utility ground. I've had quite a few people write to me and say, I can't find it, or whatever, or an old house, or something like that. And you'll have to consult with an electrician to do that. When I put the box out here on the side of the house, I thought about it, and 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 I finally decided to just hire an electrician to uh, put it in. He had all the tools. He put in an extra ground rod. He got everything bonded and all that sort of thing. And then I just connected cables from there. So... There you have it. I hope that helps. I know I'm telling you things that you probably don't want to hear, especially about that cable coming in high. But don't let lightning find a way into your house. Get this book. Now, I will tell you it's pretty technical, not in equation-wise, but it is technical in the sense of what goes to what, and this goes here, and this goes there, and so on. And if you have any questions, you should contact your friendly local electrician. So there you have it. Until we next meet, 73.